Hello and welcome to Motoring First. Shumi has been out and about on a racetrack riding two Yamahas, which I am um, very keen to know because I'm sure this is going to be a complete surprise what these bikes are like. Absolutely. Right? We've never seen these bikes before. Never before, right? Never. Brand new. Brand new. So what was it like? I'm sure you got hours and hours because it's a Yamaha, it's a racetrack. Hours and hours and hours, like three hours because it was the R3. Ah, nice. Three hours is a lot, man. That, that's no, no, no. Okay. Okay, let's set context here. All of what he has said is not actually true. Okay. Uh, it's very affordable. <laughs> Price will discuss last because it will completely skew the story and I refuse to have this story being skewed because these are two good motorcycles with issues. Okay. Mm. First, the R3 is not new to us because Yamaha has not internationally globally updated the R3. So what it was in 2018, more or less, it is still the same motorcycle. Except for the design for the R3, the look. Little change in design, mm. upside down forks has been added and obviously it's BS6 or Euro 5, however you call it, mm. that. Apart from that, from 2018 till now, just like the Ninja 400, if you think about it, nothing has changed on this motorcycle. So mm. we are getting the updated R3, but if you already have an R3, you more or less have this R3. Okay. Okay. Uh, second, the MTO3 is the new introduction here. Hmm. I'm not calling it brand brand new because it's actually identical to the R3 apart from the handlebar, hmm. the headlight design and the lack of a fairing. Hmm. Nothing else has been changed on the MTO3 from the R3. Gearing is the same, seating position except for the handlebar is the same, etc, etc. Okay. So, is there a difference in the riding uh, experience? Yes. But is there so much difference that you can call the MTO3 a brand new introduction to this country? In name, yes. Hmm. But uh, it's effectively the R3 with a slightly different setup. That's all. And we got 15 minutes on each motorcycle only at the Budh International Circuit. So whatever we are telling you now is I have experienced it only in the track environment for a precise 15 minutes each. Okay. So how do we go about this? Um, I you can, can summarize it. Okay. Um, I didn't I already do that? <laughs> Okay, these are two great motorcycles with parallel twin engines, which we've always appreciated for how tractable they are. So they're great for everyday use, great for touring, great top end performance, all done in one clean move. So it's friendly, it's fast. It's a, I mean, I'm assuming based on the R3 earlier, great handling. Um, so really a, a super all rounder. Um, and those who have it will enjoy it for years and years because they are built to Yamaha spec. So that nothing really goes wrong with them. Yes, and you will also have it for years and years because you would have spent most of your savings acquiring them. But we will come to that at the end. Okay, we're not going to discuss price yet. Hey, somebody's jumping the gun here. Huh? No, no, okay. no, I'm just setting context. Okay, now what you should know about the R3 is that it is, as he said, a really nice motorcycle to ride. It's uh, top ND, the engine, but it is a smooth linear engine. So mm. it builds up to it and it builds up very nicely and smoothly. So if you're a learning motorcycle rider trying to go to the track and exploring that side of the picture, the R3 will make a great track motorcycle. Because it's an international model, if you have the means, you can find a lot of upgrade parts for R3s very easily all over Southeast Asia. It's what a lot of the Indian racers already do. I met one of them at the airport yesterday as it turns out and he said he's really excited about the R3 because now he can go to Yamaha, buy the upside down forks and upgrade the suspension on his current R3, R3. race bike. Oh. Because all the other uh, engine performance parts is already sourced from Southeast Asia and has a reasonable fast bike out of it. All right. Right. Nice. The handling of the R3 has always been epic. It's a sweetheart. You can make it do almost whatever you want. And that's true whether you know what you want from it or not. Because like the R15, it upgrades and gives you that sense of forgiveness. So you can make a mistake. It allows you to have a mistake, have a moment. Doesn't scare you immediately. And it's really, really sweet. I remember the R3 launch back then, 2018, uh, was also at BSE. Exiting the final corner onto the main straight. Mm the rear would just go out from under you. Hmm. The tires, those MRFs were very un-MRF. These are not MRFs. So the last time, it was a CKD import, if I'm not mistaken. So there were Indian parts on it, including the MRFs you refer to. One MRF has actually changed a lot in that intervening period and their new steel brace tires are actually regarded very highly, one. Second, this is a 
CBU import from Indonesia in the process of which I figured out that we do have an FTA with Indonesia mm. also. Yamaha India told me that they get the same taxation advantage or rate as they get from the Thai FTA. The R3s are made in Thailand, but they don't have the capacity to supply India, which is why they're being sourced from Indonesia instead. This is all new information to me. And honestly, I haven't verified this information. I don't know if the tax structure is exactly the same between Thailand and India, right. which might have something to do with the price, which we'll discuss at the end. But what that also means is that the tires are Dunlop Sport Maxis. So in that sense, there is an upgraded tire on this motorcycle. And I wouldn't say that I rode really well because to me, usually that is the second session at the racetrack, not the first one. But even in the first session, whatever mistakes I made while I tried to remember my lines at BIC, I didn't think that the tires were the limit of what I was doing. The tire pressures might have been. Okay. Because it was a reasonably cold morning, but I was going reasonably quickly. And I think 2 PSI under is what they were running for mm. this entire group. And I don't want to upset that process. Maybe I would have preferred a little bit lower tire pressures and I would have had even more confidence mm. in the bike. But what I really like about this chassis, it goes where you point it, when you point it, it does those things. And it always feels calm. Mm. The R3 feels like a natural extension of what you think should happen on a motorcycle. Mm. And that sweetness in that aggression mm. is something only Yamaha does. Right. Okay. So it, it, you are able to ride it aggressively. You are able to ride it accurately. And at the same time, there is a sense of there is room here to make a mistake and recover from and not to worry too much. And it's a very, very nice, powerful, emotional riding experience. It's like a guiding hand. Yeah, it's like a guiding hand. And the MTO3 is thankfully very similar. Same tires, same brakes, everything. Hmm. You sit upright, so your sense of connection is a little bit lower. Hmm. The problem with the MTO3 is the strangest one. The tank is a different shape from the okay. R3. There are knee recesses which are sort of like this and your knee goes under the recess. The recess actually protrudes downwards quite a bit. Okay. So I struggled to find place to put my feet in between the foot peg and the knee recess. I found the room to be restricted. So the seats, not a problem. The handlebars, not a problem. But at six foot, I had a struggle getting my feet to fit in. And once they did, then I felt sort of locked into that motorcycle. So that would not be a problem for me as I'm short. Yeah. So if you're a taller rider and I'm going to guess 5, 10, 11 plus, you'd want to take a test ride on an MTO3 for sure to make sure that you fit because moving foot pegs is an expensive proposition. It can be done, obviously, but it is expensive because the R3 is a race bike. There will be rear sets available quite easily. Southeast Asia, not India, maybe. So you can move those foot pegs around, but it is going to cost you money. So just verify that you fit before you take on the MTO3. And have uh, Yama spoken anything at all about accessories with this bike? Uh, on the website, there is a taller screen or something like that, some small things. Okay. I'm no longer taking the Yamaha accessory setup very seriously because in the Aerox's case, there were the extra suspension, etc. And I don't think anybody managed to buy it from Yamaha directly without considerable amounts of chasing the dealer to be able to place those orders and stuff. Until Yamaha gets serious about it, I think I'm going to assume that you have to go to the aftermarket. I'm sorry, man, but can I take Yamaha seriously? They've called you all the way to BIC and give you 15 minutes on each motorcycle? No, look, uh, to give credit where it's due, this event wasn't supposed to happen at all. Right. Uh, two things happened. One is I think Yamaha took a bunch of journalists to Thailand where they rode around and they filed the stories before everybody. So a lot of people would have called Yamaha and expressed their uh, displeasure. displeasure at this. Uh, we don't do this anymore. So we were out of that loop completely. But Yamaha was doing a track day for its customers and they managed to borrow some time from that track day for the media to come and experience. So And they had three uh, R3s and three MTO3s, maybe a couple of backup bikes. So it was a limited, small, short event. I'm glad that I got to ride the bike because remember with the R3 spending three days riding this bike is not required because they haven't fundamentally changed yeah. it. If you have good notes, a good memory and a good record of what you've been doing with this motorcycle, the new motorcycle is an extension of what it does. It doesn't fundamentally change what it does. So it has no new electronics? It has no electronics at all apart from dual channel ABS. Okay. Instrument cluster? It's the LCD cluster the same as before. So none of the fanciness that the R1 No, it's a retro sports bike, bro. No, because the R15 gets traction control. Traction control, quick, shifter, quick shifter. There's a color TFT on the top yeah. model. Yeah, and the R3 gets none of this. None of it. Yeah, globally, but globally the R3 gets none of it. I don't, okay. I mean, it's not like Yamaha's shortchanging India. They're shortchanging everybody. Hmm. Right? The R3 is a very basic. Like somebody pointed out in the comments, and I hadn't made the connection, but this is a trellis frame like hmm. a steel tube frame. The R3, uh, sorry, the R15 
has the aluminium delta box. Delta box. I hadn't even noticed that the delta box sticker isn't on the mm. fairing, and I'm sure people will go and put delta box stickers yeah. from the R15 onto the R3. So currently, at the moment as it is, there is a huge mismatch between the equipment levels and the technology that the R15 presents as a locally made motorcycle, mm. and the R3 as an import. And it's a very strange situation because it's not like they despect the bike for India. I'm sorry, I'm just baffled at a global level. I think Yamaha is baffled at a global level if you think about it. Yeah, that's exactly why. Yeah, so uh, I was uh, listening to Matt Oxley and Peter Baum who do a MotoGP podcast mm. and they were also talking about how the Japanese are in a very strange space. I was talking to somebody else who works for a Japanese company. He said only one thing which I can discuss and he said even in electronics they are not able to innovate anymore. Right. They're losing that battle, which used to be their battle. So there is a larger story here. And if you'll permit me, I want to discuss this with Karthik in detail, including all the Japanese brands in and out of automobiles on this Connect season two, which is coming really soon. So I'm going to excuse myself from this discussion about what the Japanese are up to. But we know one thing, Yamaha in India hasn't done much. Mm. Okay, uh, I had another conversation with uh, somebody yesterday who was trying to buy a Yamaha because they're an RX100 fan. They can't find an RX100 right now and uh, their mother won't allow them to buy an RD350, so that's out. No interest in the FZ at all. Oh. And as soon as he said that, I said, okay, so you have a very simple choice, R15 or MT. And he says, what else? I said, they don't make anything else. Right. Right. And if you think about a size of the brand that Yamaha is, the fact that their product line is down to effectively two scooters or one commuter and two 150s, it's crazy. You know what the funny thing is? The most that people have come and told me recently about a Yamaha that they're buying is a scooter, Aerox. <laughs> I'm, yeah, sorry, Aerox. I forgot about the Aerox. I mean, so many people have come and said, ah, I'll buy the Aerox. Why? Because it's a Yamaha. Yeah. Like Yamaha. Yeah, yeah. And I'm so shocked that that brand loyalty towards Yamaha, it has not budged an inch no matter how hard Yamaha India has tried to mess with it. Right. We still think of it as a performance brand. We still love what the brand stands for. And uh, I mean, some people want to say bus Yamaha, but most of the people are still <laughs> saying yes, Yamaha. If the R3's price was a little bit different, we would be saying hum do R3. You know what I mean? So it's the strangest thing that this Japanese <laughs> company... Or manage kar sakte. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the strangest thing that this Japanese company can't seem to see the forest for the trees. I mean, it's the strangest, strangest thing. It's baffling. Right? But... There is a silver lining in the story, which I will discuss last, but I think Karthik has brought us to the point where we now have to discuss the price. So let's discuss the price. What do you think about the price, Karthik? Oh, I think it's fantastic. Yeah. I think it's amazing because it gives a sense of aspiration and um, uh, desirability to the brand Yamaha that I had not envisioned earlier. And sure, if I buy an R3, it will be a statement bigger than buying any other big bike of any sort. Because I've bought an R3. I'm, I'm an R3 owner. Job done. Not an MTO3 owner. Oh, oh, that's another. That's 5,000 rupees less, bro. It's 5,000 rupees less for not having a fairing. So I'm assuming if you crash your R, uh, your R3, it'll cost only 5,000 bucks to get a fairing. I do like how they look. That's the only part that we didn't discuss earlier. Okay, I, I've always liked the Yamaha's two headlight design, mm. and the R3 now has a really old school two headlight design that reminds you of the older R6s and stuff. I really, really like looking at it. What I must point out is qualitatively didn't feel like an international product. Sorry, does it at any point remind you of the Desmo Sidici? No. No? No. I didn't the, make the, the connection. Headlamp? That... I didn't make the connection. Oh, okay, to fine. me, it reminded me of an older school, I'm going to say mid-2000s Yamaha. Just the fairing part, just the headlamps part of it. Didn't remind me no? of the okay. Ducati. It reminded me of mid-2000s Yamahas, which used to have these kinds of shapes with a ram air kind of mm. duct in the middle. And I was quite happy to see it, honestly. Mm. This MTO3 headlight and all of that, if you like it, I'm fine with it. But this Yamaha making these weird faces in, I'm not totally a fan. Right. There are some angles from which I like it. There are some angles from which I'm like, I don't know why this is needed. It's not really a pertinent discussion because I think popular opinion is that once you're on the bike, you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, absolutely. And once you're on the bike, I'm telling you, no matter what you say about these bikes, when you ride these bikes, you will enjoy the experience. The question is, the threshold to coming to enjoy the experience has been set so high with this price that I don't think a lot of people are going to cross that barrier. So strong is the character of that platform that I still remember how it sounds, 
how it accelerates it's not like this like the kawasaki kind of you know just absolute smoothness no, it's not. it has that slight pulse to it yeah. you will hear the engine work yes. you i i remember how the suspension works uh, and because that i mean it's amazing that you know again like with the r15 with this with that link mono shock the kind of breadth of ability that the motorcycles it's, yeah, bring it's such a such a brilliant I motorcycle mean, which shumi will surely verify once uh, he gets the bikes here but uh, you know that's the kind of ability they pack their su- the motorcycles that really connect with you yeah absolutely right? i think the problem here primarily is packaging and pricing in terms of packaging this complete lack of features and electronics i think yamaha could pull it off with the tenere because the dot bike community can still be made to believe that without any electronics is a better motorcycle i don't think the sport bike world works like that anymore and in india where the value is driven from these features even when the features don't get used a lot like bluetooth for example i don't think today you can justify the lack of a quick shifter when a cheaper bike in your own line has <laughs> it you can't justify the size of the usd fork when the cheaper bike has a bigger usd fork you can't justify it when so that has bluetooth yeah the r15s usd forks have a larger diameter than the r3s okay yeah so it's a very strange situation then comes the question of price luckily we have the ninja 400 holding uh, actually no luckily we have the zx4 r holding station as the stupidest <laughs> price on earth at 10 lakh rupees for a 400 below which is below about half that is the ninja 400 which is 5.24 x delhi uh, which will be replaced by the ninja 500 let's see what the increment on that is because i think kawasaki can certainly raise the bar on this they have shown the ability to do it below that is these two yamahas at about 4.7 lakh rupees it's just so much money that you could do so much with motorcycles with that it doesn't make sense to buy one if you buy one i promise you will be happy i to have no doubt about it but whether you will be able to buy one this price is very difficult because below this is a very well equipped aprilia wait stop right there somebody in italy right now is going what is going on we to the price but r is 457 hi <laughs> yamaha's doing 4.7 we can do 5.7 Yeah, I mean, literally, if the Aprilia can be priced there, but the Aprilia is made in Baramati. <laughs> well, uh, that's Baramati, okay? That's how the Italians say it, and it actually makes it sound like it's not in Maharashtra; it's in the Tuscan valleys or something. And that's exactly the part that just feels. I mean, how long has Yamaha been in India? How long has uh, Piaggio been? So in just India? hold that thought because I'm coming to that next. So I was saying 4.7 are the Yamahas then below that 4.1 is uh, the Aprilia and below that is the RC390 today at about 3.2 lakh rupees and somebody said do you think KTM and Aprilia have paid Yamaha to make them look good <laughs> it's not it doesn't work like that but yeah it certainly feels like that because this price just makes no sense so let's discuss how the pricing came to be like this and what Yamaha is actually up to so does it matter You should know that we've heard Yamaha think about doing a CKD line for I'm going to say six to seven years at this point. That's all. Yeah, it matters. And the reason why the Japanese can't seem to make up their mind is because the Japanese are hardcore volume-oriented organizations. They like mass sales. They're all like that. And Yamaha has still not cracked the volume segment in India well enough to be able to think beyond it as a logical next thing for them to do. you know it's like a to do list where until you do item 1 how can you do item 2 and they're stuck at that and all the committees inside yamaha were trying to decide and make this decision all seem to be stuck at it now there is a silver lining i am told that the current ceo of yamaha his name is chihana san i think i'm not sure uh, that he is a decisive japanese person who has decided that yamaha must push into the premium segment and we don't have a choice about it anymore as yamaha india So what I am being told, and I am hoping that this is true, both my fingers are crossed to the point where they are hurting right now, is next year 2024 we will see a reinvigorated Yamaha, which will push much harder into the premium segment. I'm sorry. Maybe. What, what does that mean? Maybe with a CKD line, with certainly a lot of products. Let me temper this for you. I have heard this before. I would like to see it done this time. I am told that this new CEO is capable of achieving these things. So I am going to. for one more time give a little bit of faith and leave it to yamaha and say okay let's see it i like it that the shoe is on the other foot this time around i am not buying any of it yeah yeah at these prices i am buying none of it either okay so the mt07 r7 i'm told all of that is at least a year away it's not going to happen anytime soon and that will come through ckd there's no other reason why it should take a year is how i am solving this yes yeah. 
right otherwise i mean the only reason why it would take a year for a cvu mt07 and r7 to come here is because there's 35 japanese engineers walking the bikes from indonesia to india slowly one step at a time and yeah and they can't use the engines because they're brand new they'll be zero on the clock right <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah. So I am assuming that this year before we can get the 700s is because the CKD line has finally been uh, greenlit or whatever. I'm hoping, hmm. hope, hope. Uh, okay, fine. Right. But honestly, what we've seen Yamaha do in India for the last eight or ten years, I think we should almost be calling it done. Okay. So this is where we are at. If you have any questions. Leave them in the comment, but we have your questions, so let's get into user questions because I think this time we've got some really good questions. I'm really happy to see these. Okay, from the user questions, there sure. is Shivraj Sahu. Hmm. What constraints does Yamaha face that they can't locally manufacture motorcycles when brands when brands like Aprilia can? So remember that Aprilia has not really done a CKD line. They've had a very small CBU operation for the RSV and the Tuono, etc. But they've had the Baramati factory for a really long time, and that factory was built with a one and a half lakh installed capacity, if I remember correctly, which they are nowhere close to using for absolutely years together. For the West Pass, right? So if you think about what Aprilia has been able to do, they are actually behind their own schedule because they have created motorcycles for India. The market has moved on. They've had to reject those projects and restart the RS four five seven. If anything is years behind where it should have been in the first place. now they know that they can make it in india at that quality level they can replicate the duke uh, program in that sense and then export this bike a lot and sell a few of them in india and that will be the gambit yamaha has never made those steps at all now they are still in the loop of making that decision saying should we really have a ckd line or not yamaha needs to realize that if they are going to be successful in the world's largest two wheeler market they are going to have to play the volume game which they are terrible at but they also have to going to play the premium game which is naturally theirs for the taking they just haven't made the effort yet rohan daniel isaac asks how does it compare with the ninja 300 and the ninja 400 i refuse to discuss the ninja 300 the ninja 300 was replaced by the ninja 400 in 2018 india is one of two or three countries left in the world where kawasaki insists on selling this retired motorcycle i refuse to discuss it as far as the ninja 400 is concerned it's a terrific motorcycle we have a story on it coming very soon i loved 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 riding it and the price makes no 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 sense at all all righty then uh, no i'm serious i'm serious r3 ninja 400 they are god like motorcycles to ride if you ride them you will fall in love with them then the price will just be a huge slap in the face because there's no way to justify it and just like the r3 the ninja 400 is no equipment at all but what a bike what a bike The YD guy in '95. I currently own a 2015 Honda CBR 250R, which I adore and have put quite a few kilometers on it. Would it be a sensible upgrade to the R3 from the CBR, as I'm not looking into much more powerful motorcycles at this point of time? It can be if you can justify the price to yourself. It can be because it has all the attributes that you love about your CBR 250R. Plus, it will be more reliable than the CBR 250R because remember, as much as Honda gets a lot of credit for their quality, the CBR 250R was not one of their most reliable products in India. So, if you look at it from every side, yes, I think you are on the right track here. I would be looking for a used R3, not a new one, because they are super reliable motorcycles. Nothing really happens to them, and everything is a relatively basic thing, like suspension is basic. So, getting it fixed in the aftermarket for a used bike shouldn't be a challenge at all. So, I don't know. You want to spend 4.7 on a new R3 for this? A used R3 would do it, and you can use that money to get parts which you can upgrade it with, if you need to. Yeah, or use it to do more miles and do more things with your new R3, as it were. User FL eight VW four SN eight V about handling. Does R one five's handling compare or even surpass the handling of its bigger siblings? Like power, does handling and the sharpness get better with price? Does R three, R six, or R one handle and corner better than the R one five while being heavier? I love this question because there is so much connect between the R15 and the R3 and the R6 and the R1 and I have had the privilege of riding all four of them at pace at the race track and they are all super super nice motorcycles in terms of the aggression level obviously goes up the ability level goes up the sharpness level goes up but that sense of sweetness and friendliness never seems to change right so if you're riding it hard I've ridden the uh, one generation before the current R6 Hard. I have ridden the previous generation of the R6 hard. I have ridden cross planes, pre-cross planes, and the current R1s hard at the racetrack. They are all 
beautiful, friendly, sweetheart motorcycles. I can't believe that Yamaha can't nail this part of the picture because I'm honestly telling you, if one guy in your group, especially if it's a sport motorcycle oriented group, were to get one of these R series Yamahas, everybody would just follow suit. Pradyumna GU asks, how good are gear shifts with no slipper clutch at high speeds? Uh, so the lack of the slipper clutch is obviously an issue that Yamaha has to deal with because today I think there are what 150 cc motorcycles with slip assist clutches. The slip assist clutches primary job is to reduce your lever effort, it's not actually a performance tool. A proper slip uh, slipper clutch would give you the ability to downshift very aggressively. It's not something you'd really do on the street except maybe in an emergency and allow the rear wheel to rotate so you maintain control over that situation. So honestly, in daily riding on a motorcycle like the R3, I don't think the slipper clutch being missing is going to be a big deal except for the extra clutch effort. I rode it at the racetrack, I didn't use the clutch much so I don't have data to tell you that it was hard or not. But I suspect these Yamahas being the way they are, it's not going to be a super, super large challenge. So Pradyumna, it's not at higher speeds that you need it, it's when you're coming down from higher speeds that you'll want the slipper clutch properly, which in typical road conditions, you shouldn't be getting into that space at all. Yeah. So Iladdin Muhammad had asked, uh, why do you think the Armin 5 gets more features than the R3? Remember that the Japanese work in committees and the committee's job is to decide what happens next and then another committee's job is to decide if that committee did a good job then the third committee's job is to approve the first committee's job and then the fifth committee will actually make the solution that needs to answer the questions that the first committee raised then there'll be the sixth committee that will validate and verify the solutions that are actually hardware now and so on and so forth right because the R15 was designed to be sold in India, there would be a lot more decision making going on which is specific to Indian value challenges and uh, what kind of equipment needs to be put on the motorcycle, what definitely needs to be there, what would be a step up. And they've taken the R15 to give them credit where it's due to a very high level of both equipment specification and performance, right? The R3 is a global model that sits in what is, I think, the upper end of their learner class as it were, right? It's the 250 to 300, 400 cc class with all the motorcycles being the same price there. It's not the case in India, right? So the RC390, Ninja 400 and now the 500, uh, the uh, R3, RC390, all of these bikes are roughly the same price, right? If you look at how the global market is played, they are not as equipment oriented and feature oriented as we are. So Yamaha did a solution that seems to work reasonably well for them in Southeast Asia, America, etc. That's the solution they have and that's what they're bringing to India. So you have two choices. One is to say thank you so much for obliging us by giving us the choice to buy it. Or two, rejecting saying that this is not good enough for India, forcing Yamaha to rethink their strategy. But these are the only two options you've got because this is the only motorcycle Yamaha's got. Okay. Vaishak Raghu Kumar, 995. Huh. Do you think a government might understand that imposing such humongous taxes on CBU and CKD is actually discouraging our local manufacturers from stepping up to international standards? Uh, so Vaishak is a regular commenter on motoring. Hi. Uh, there's two ways to look at it, okay? As an enthusiast, the higher they raise the taxes, the harder it becomes for us to buy these motorcycles, etc, etc, is a valid perspective and it's very frustrating to have to live behind that taxation structure. But the other side of it is if it wasn't for the taxation structure, a lot of the technology that has been brought to India and localized into manufacturing today also would not come because it just be simpler for them to just throw the product at us and leave it be. Uh, if you look at the Pakistan automotive market, the fact that they fail to protect their local technology and development is why they don't have any local manufacturing. So there's two sides to this story. If you're looking at it as a government which needs to generate long-term employment, which needs to in-house the technology and all of these things, maybe the barriers were required and we can argue if they are still required today or not. On the other side, it is absolutely true that Indian manufacturers also get lazy now and then and then they don't want to be world-class, they just want to be good enough to succeed in India, which is like a narrow kind of goal. So there's three, four sides to the story. I'm going to say that increasingly I prefer that these duties remain high and manufacturers who take our market seriously do take our market seriously and then bring their best here, make it here, employ Indians to do it, transfer that technology to us, teach us how to do those things. And that includes service manufacturing and all parts of it. I would rather have it that way, even if it means that I have to give up a couple of years of more savings to be able to get the same product. So I see both sides of the picture. I understand why the government does it this way. I feel the frustration as an enthusiast, but in the big picture, I'm a proud Indian and I would just rather that international companies take us a heck of a lot more seriously than they are right now. And see, we're a market that's large enough that even, I mean, especially taking this context of the R3 and the MT-03, there is more than enough reason for Yamaha to invest in India to actually make these motorcycles here as well. If KTM's doing it, um, 
Triumph Bajaj are doing it, uh, Aprilia is doing it. Yeah, you can shorten that answer if everybody who's not Japanese is doing it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I mean, there's enough sense in making these bikes in India. So there is a reason why these, uh, those rules exist is to facilitate our market, create better environment here. And I think that should happen. Vardhan Rathi. Oh. Hi, Vardhan. He's also yeah. a regular commenter. Yeah. <laughs> I've always felt Yamaha charges an initial premium which eventually sets off with longevity and quality. Is it the same case this time too? Because these are old motorcycles, latest versions of relatively old motorcycles, I think they're going to be super reliable. So you can make a case for it. But I don't think that this kind of price justifies that kind of a premium on it, right? If this motorcycle was, let's say, 30, 40, 50,000 rupees more than the 390, I'd say, yeah, sure, I'd pay 50 extra K to Yamaha, pick up a little bit less equipment, but I know that nothing will happen to this engine. And this R3 engine has a global reputation, this 321 has a global reputation for being a bulletproof, nothing happens to it engine, no matter how hard you push it. I'd understand that. But at this kind of 3.2 to 4.7, no, no. Okay. Uh, many people have asked, how does it compare to the Aprilia RS457? So, uh, we haven't tested the RS457, so there is absolutely no way to answer this question. The reliability of the Aprilia is another question that seems to show up here and there. But again, remember, a reliability can only be established once time has passed. So, how can I tell you if the RS457 will be reliable today when I haven't tested it or even tomorrow when I have tested it for two weeks and put, let's say, 2000 kilometers on it? It's not enough. If you have that doubt in your mind, go back to our usual advice about buying brand new motorcycles from brand new uh, variable filled situations like new factories etc just wait give it six months the answer will become obvious the rs457 does appear to be far better equipped than the r3 it does appear and listen aprilia makes fantastic motorcycles right remember aprilia is trying to make the rs457 fit into the family naturally so the five the 457 660 1100 etc should just be a natural progression from each other just like Yamaha is doing from R15, R3, R6, R1, right? If they have to do that, the RS457 has to be a super high level. And I'm hoping that they nail it because when Aprilia gets it right, there's literally nobody else making anything like it. So high hopes, but no way to say whether it's better than the R3 or not. It should be. Very high hopes. Um, versus KTM and um, basically the 390. Look, the 390 is 3.2 lakh rupees, the R3 is 4.7 lakh rupees. So to me, this point is moot. Get an RC390. Even if your RC390 is terrible in terms of reliability, you still have a one and a half lakh rupees to fix it with. No KTM I've ever met is that kind of unreliable, right? Breadth and of ability. So the RC390 has actually become much better in this current generation. The earlier RC390s were hard motorcycles to ride fast, where the challenge ramped much faster than your skill level would ramp, which was interesting for hardcore riders, but obviously too challenging for relatively casual riders. The new RC390 is a much simpler motorcycle to ride. It's a far more accessible kind of performance. So the gap to the Yamaha on that particular front has narrowed a lot. That's This is 42 bhp from a twin cylinder engine with a very linear power curve. That is currently 44 odd, it will become 47 next year. The curve is becoming more linear in the process too. You've got lightweight wheels, we make the chassis feel much nicer and next year chassis will be magic. So let's talk about 390 Duke then, the new one. Uh, the 390 Duke to me will do a lot more than the R3 in many situations in everyday riding. At the track, obviously the R3 because of the format will have a certain advantage. So there is no real situation apart from you're a Yamaha fan, you have a lot of money, you're a huge R3 fan and you must have one. That the price of the R3 will allow me to say, yes, you should get the R3. I thought uh, in touring scenarios, you would have said, okay, if you plan to use this to travel long distances. So there is a question, I think, in that series about touring also. And let me say, if you are willing to tour on a sports bike, the R3 will make a terrific tourer because it's not that committed a riding position. It's a reasonably comfortable motorcycle. It's always had a very good suspension setup that is neither too hard nor too soft. So it already has all the elements of a tourer. If you think about the RR310, but far more powerful and a lot more comfortable both put together, you will get the R3 in that picture. Would I take pillions on this motorcycle? Absolutely not. But can you mount a fair amount of luggage and go touring on an R3? I think you totally can. I think the MTO3 will struggle more than the R3 on this front because of the space issue that your knee will cause and the fact that there is no wind protection, etc. So the R3 actually will make a surprisingly good sport tourer, but with a slightly committed riding position. That's a headline. Buy the R3 for touring. 
using India as a dumping ground for stock clearance is not cool. Why does <laughs> Yama treat India so poorly? Okay, so look, I've heard this comment, including this version, which says that they picked up unused, sold units from all over the earth and dumped them in I've India. I've not called out a name because there were many such queries. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. So I've I've heard all versions of this, including one which suggests or. Uh, from a bunch of people which suggest Yamaha is going around buying old R3s lying unsold in all kinds of countries and bringing them to India and dumping them here. Look, it is logistically impossible for Yamaha to organize oh, this. That's the question. Oh, right. God. Okay. Think about it like this. Yamaha is a structured Japanese company that does structured things. Imagine an Indian guy whose job it will become to say, call up Indonesia and see how much units they've got, then call Thailand, then call US, then call Europe. Listen, the, their Yamaha counterparts there are also Japanese. They will just not get a response in time for them to be able to launch this motorcycle at all if that's what they were up to. So first of all, there is no chance that this is a dumping activity. Yamaha has got the strategy kind of weird. Yes, they are still definitely sourcing freshly made motorcycles from the Indonesian factory. These are not lying unsold somewhere and being rerouted here. I would, I mean, it's just logistically impossible to do. Yes, it is coming at an odd time. Because the new R3 should be due now. Because 2018, that means 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, we are five years in. So there should be a major update coming to the R3. If Yamaha continues to do what Kawasaki does to us and sell this R3 instead of the new one, it will be one more nail. I don't want to say the next word. Varun Manoranjan, same mistake as Honda made with CB500X. In pricing terms and yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Let's and go. remember that I think that the Japanese make case studies of everything. It's my feeling. Again, we'll discuss this in detail on uh, Disconnect Season 2. But when the R3 fails, when the MTO3 fails, it'll be one more way for the Japanese to report to Japan and saying, see, India's not ready. It's very Bis sad. Biswadeep Chakravarti and others have asked, when will they do something about the atrocious service centers? Yeah, so look. Whatever we've heard about Yamaha service center seems to be a really inconsistent picture rather than a terrible picture where there are people who had good experiences and people who had bad experiences. So I'm not going to s judge Yamaha or give you a verdict right now, but here's what we can do. Why don't you leave me a comment if you have a Yamaha telling us what your service experience was like. Don't tell me the name of the dealer because it's a little bit of blame game and pointing fingers. But do tell us which city you are in. So we get a sense of is there a skew, let's say western region to eastern region or something where Yamaha service is better or worse. Let's find out. It was very useful to us when you did this with us the last time and it told us for example Royal Enfield has pretty consistently good uh, service quality but there are sporadic issues here and there. TVS service consistently underperforms. Uh, Bajaj services surprisingly good according to you guys. KTM service is surprisingly good. It gave us a sense of how to guide your decision making. Help us with Yamaha, please. Uh, Deepak Raj D'Souza, nice question. What's the benefit of a twin cylinder engine? Remember that each engine configuration has moving parts inside. The most fast moving of which is usually the piston and the con rod connected to it. And it creates certain kinds of vibration. The more cylinders you have, these vibrations interact in various directions and planes. And that's what gives these engines their core nature. Some of these elements are positive, some of these elements are negative. And if you look at the larger single cylinder engines like 650s, the vibration is a big challenge because single cylinder engines shake a lot because there's nothing to oppose the vibrations that this piston is creating. What you can do with a twin is use two pistons to move against each other in terms of vibration and create a much smoother engine. That's advantage number one. Second, because you've got your power stroke split into two places, you can control your power delivery a little bit better. So twins can feel a lot smoother to ride because the vibration is better controlled and you have two combustion events that you can design to do a certain job, which also allows you to tune sound and all of those things. Okay. In terms of riding experience, if you tune them similarly enough and have very similar performance, there may not automatically be a huge difference in your riding experience. But we go from singles to twins to triples to fours, etc. Because we want a different feeling and not necessarily just more performance. The only way to establish this for yourself is to ride somebody's single, ride a twin, ride a triple. This will take time. This might take years for you to organize and get a sense of which format you gravitate towards. I'll give you my example. To me, an inline four was never an engine that I was attracted towards. Although I know a lot of Indians like that smoothness. I discovered V4s by mistake. When I tested the 2.0 and fell in love with it, today in my garage, I have two V4s and a single. And I'm not thinking about a twin or a triple right now. And I discovered this literally by riding, riding, riding and saying, hey, I love how this V4 is, right? So I would say 
a, a lot of us get the idea that I must upgrade to a twin from a single, upgrade to the experience you want and it doesn't necessarily have to be a twin cylinder to give you that kick. Yeah, uh, the only thing to add over there, by going from let's say a 400 single to a two, twin, which is 200 whatever, right? What, what it allows the engine to do is to rev better, right? It can make more power through that if they choose to, they don't have to. But a lot of the twins that we get today get 270 degree cranks for good rideability and of course performance. I don't know if that is the case here with the R3, I don't remember anymore. But a lot Yeah, but of see, if you look at the Ninja 400 twin and the R3 That's twin. also 270? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know if they're 270s or not, but I know that they've been tuned to do a linear build-up of torque. Correct. Whereas, for example, the previous generation RC390 was very peaky in the sense of there'd be nothing, 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 6000 RPM, here's a lot. Mm. Right, These twins are able to produce reasonable amounts of torque before the horsepower comes in and really takes the motorcycle forward, right? They're more flexible, but I think there is a personality between the yes, different, uh, which allows you to do more. You get more flexibility yeah, you more out latitude. of the twins. Absolutely, yeah. you do have more latitude for sure. So, okay, Rainus is Pearl 2650. Is traction control a must? If yes, how much does it affect in varying road conditions? What about the slipper clutch assist? Is it necessary? Can I take this one? Sure. Coming to the Busa, which I have, no traction control. And I swear the first time I rode it, I thought that this is going to be trouble, especially because we were riding it in mixed conditions where it was raining, not raining. So traction control, the need for it is, of course, the conditions matter, the power matters. But if the engine itself is friendly, the real need for the traction control is in case of emergencies. Let's say suddenly there's oil or there's, I mean, in case of oil, nine or ten times you won't be able yeah, to do much. Yeah. Uh, let's say there's sand or something and it'll help you catch that situation. But if you have a really good motorcycle and like the R3 is or the MTO3 is, you know, with a great smooth power delivery, the traction control isn't an absolute must because they're already very friendly and predictable. But yep. in emergencies, they will be helpful. Yeah. So uh, to me, the basic hygiene electronics that all motorcycles should have, and you shouldn't buy anything that doesn't have it, is dual channel ABS, right? That is a situation where you are way out of your league in terms of using the brakes for whatever reason. Could be a lack of skill, could be the a change in the surface condition, could be rain, could be anything. Whatever happens, the ABS has your back. To me, that is the definite minimum. Mm. If you have a really nice, smooth 40 bhp bike like these R3s are, I don't think you're going to get the traction control to activate unless you ride badly. And if you ride badly, traction control is there helping you out. Or have perhaps, terrible tires. <laughs> or have terrible tires. But but in those situations, terrible tires, you should be changing your tires. Worse, if you're riding badly, look, at the end of the day, no electronics are going to save you. You should really be thinking about how to ride better instead. Any rider who you consider good never does this. It's just not going to happen. It's a very sudden input and you never make sudden inputs on motorcycles because they react faster than your wrist is moving anyway, right? So if you think about it like that, ride better, you'll use traction control less even if you have it and that means you're riding better than before. When you get to stupid amounts of horsepower, when you have a 130-40 bhp bike in our kinds of roads where the surface itself isn't predictable, you absolutely must have traction control and it should be on because if you step over the limit, it will catch you and allow you to continue to ride. That's the utility of it. What is your risk profile? What is your risk appetite? What motorcycle you ride? That actually determines how much you're going to use it. No, no, we do have different perspectives and you don't have to laugh about it. We've done this before on Disconnect Season 1 if you, if you remember. So yeah, um, my perspective is that if you have that ability to learn what the bike, where its limit is, give yourself that time. Courage. And that, <laughs> no, I think it's a part of Courage. bonding with the motorcycle, Courage. right? And uh, there are the people who learn by stepping over the limit and say, oh, that's where the limit was. And there's people like me who creep up to the limit and say, where is it, where is it, where is it? And it may take me six months to find the limit that he'll find in a day. I am comfortable with, with that and for that I need the electronics. He's comfortable stepping over the limit and coming back and say, okay, so that's where it was. I take it slow. Okay. Okay, last question. Amit Narona, hmm. will a fat guy be able to ride? Yes, fat people do exist. Bro. <laughs> I don't know why there's so much angst in that. But uh, <laughs> look, these are reasonably spacious motorcycles. But... Describing a physical condition makes it really difficult to give you a blanket recommendation. I, this is not just true for people who are fat. This is also true for people who say, I have a backache, will I be able to survive this? I don't know. I don't know what kind of backache you've got. 
right so uh, i remember a previous boss of mine with two or three generations of r1s there were certain r1s he fit into and there certain r1s that he didn't fit into and there was no real way to predict that oh this one and this boss will go together or not right you'll have to go to a showroom take a test ride and find out what is comfortable for you because i don't know what your baseline is okay uh, if you were to take kartik and me and put us in the same situation where we go through a certain amount of pain and torture we will both give up at some point his pain threshold and my pain threshold aren't the same that doesn't mean that a certain amount of pain is acceptable or not it's just like a personal thing right so if you have a back ache and are wondering about the bike first figure out where the back ache is coming from go to a doctor and get it diagnosed if it's a medical condition a better seat is not going to help you hmm. right it happened to a person that i know uh, they were trying to work out and become fitter and they just kept gaining weight hmm. and they were saying i have tried everything and i said then why didn't you go to a doctor he says what would i go to a doctor for i said if you're eating less if you're exercising more and gaining weight you have a problem he had a thyroid issue it turns out as soon as he started taking medication things fell into place he would eat less he would uh, lose weight he would work out in the gym and he would gain a muscle it was perfect mm. first figure out what the medical solution is then figure out which part of the motorcycle world fits into your idea of this is acceptable and beyond this i will not be able to do i i have no way of saying clear answer for this fair point just as a very small example shumi's duke uh, he's got that uh, r6 uh, rear yep. rear shock now he's got it set up for his weight so when i ride it it feels different from what it feels for him yeah. and we've often discussed like so he'll ask me how was it to ride and i'm like yeah but you know this i felt was a little bit, like yeah because it's set up for my weight and that's something you know constantly happens with every motorcycle now this will have good suspension but i know you've said for fat guys but how fat you know and i yeah i don't know what you think fat is right Let, let's say that you are 5 uh, foot uh, 6 inches tall and the medical right weight for you is let's call it 65 kilos i don't know right I don't know if you think 66 is fat or 160 is fat. I don't know. I honestly don't know. <laughs> He's pointing at me, okay? <laughs> All right. Um uh, I think we'll wrap up. Okay, I have one question. Sure. Seat height and Seat height is like? I think 780 or something low like that. Oh, nice. Yeah. I think it's 780. So it's a really low hmm. easy to get your both your feet down kind of motorcycle and it's got reasonably soft suspension so it also sags a bit when you sit down. Okay. So this is why the seat height has not even come up. Okay. It's a flat motorcycle hmm. you sit down on it you get into it hmm. the mto3 there's nothing to get into so obviously no but the r3 you get into it you feel hmm. inside it's very very nice okay and uh, weight and all nothing no really i didn't notice anything that needed to be commented on remember i'm just going through no, the no, usual I, i'm list just of questions. saying yamaha's normally just feel naturally like yep yeah. this is exactly how it's supposed to be that's exactly how the r3 and the mto3 are so okay so should i summarize uh, the yeah. floor sir is yours <laughs> Yamaha's R3 and MTO3 have gone on sale in India. They have come into India as CBUs, which is uh, part of the explanation for the ridiculous price tag. And uh, it's even harder still to explain the five thousand rupee difference between the fully fed motorcycle and the naked motorcycle. But hey, uh, if you're picking between them, the decision is much easier. What remains as beautiful as ever are the motorcycles themselves. The parallel twin engine is super sweet, super flexible, good for everyday riding. Great motorcycle, the R3 for touring specifically, as and and it's a smooth engine. It makes all of these things easier. <laughs> and so you could pick from either of the two for the brilliance of the engine and the chassis because they're effectively the same motorcycle with the same suspension, engine, all of the. I mean, the tuning, everything is the same. The only real difference is the fairing, the headlamps, and the handlebar. So the MTO3 you would want to check out if you're taller than five ten, five eleven, because the tank is shaped a little bit differently, which could get in the way of your legs when you just want to. hang on uh aside from that uh, the interesting bits are it doesn't get the features from the R15 like a quick shifter uh slipper clutch or the color TFT display and uh, it also has skinnier for upside down forks compared to the R15 which uh, okay i i still don't get uh aside from that it's still a super friendly motorcycle low seat height easy to manage uh friendly friendly beautiful i yeah, think that's yeah, absolutely uh good tires since it's coming it doesn't get the mrfs like it did last time which were actually quite hard and i'm not going to put the blame on mrf there because i've been told that was an mrf's decision and oh uh, really yeah apparently they were asked for a longer lasting tire Yeah so non motorcyclists working in motorcycle organizations will always cause a problem so which is why this time around the Dunlop you said right yeah. so those so you love good uh good tires 
good brakes and uh, great suspension, great engine. So basically a great motorcycle that's getting a lot of flack with the uh, stupid price tag. So here's the question that you should have asked that you didn't ask in the user questions, right? Uh, I, I'd like you to answer it in the comments if you can. If this motorcycle is being imported under a free trade agreement as a CBU from Thailand slash Indonesia and it comes to 4.7 lakhs uh, ex showroom Delhi, what would the price have been if they had imported it from a non-FTA country, Europe, Japan or the United States instead? What do you think the price would have been? Leave us a comment. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs>